Hey, good morning, everyone. Pastor Brad from Emmanuel, and we're glad to have you here, uh, Emmanuel family. Uh, glad you joined with us and our friends and uh, everyone else that's uh, watching. It's good to have you with us this morning. Uh, we are doing something we have never done before, all of us. Um, watching church from home. Hope you're relaxed. Get a cup of coffee. Uh, let's enjoy our time together. And um, let's have a great time this morning. Uh, the church is scattered this morning, all over the world, really. Uh, the coronavirus, it's affecting us all. Uh, your schedules have changed, and your life has changed, and your home. And you know, as we look at the scriptures, the church is often the most powerful when it's scattered. So God's going to do something really great in all this. And as we adjust, God is already working. And um, so anyways, it's good to meet with you this morning. And we're going to take some time. We're just going to open God's word. We're going to be together. So um, get your Bible, uh, get a pen, and let's sit down, sit down together. Let's, uh, let's look at God's word together. Let's grow. And uh, let's open our hearts for what God has for us. And so anyways, we want to say good morning. It's a great day. This is a day that God has made. And so let's rejoice and uh, let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this day. Uh, churches all around the world are doing what we are doing. Uh, bless your word. It's going out. May it have power. Uh, may its grace touch our lives. May its truth continue to change us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this is great. I want to mention one thing just for our family. We're only going to do this just this time. But uh, for the Emmanuel family, um, we're still... Um, Giving faithfully to our church, you have been so good at that, and there's a ways you can give to the church, uh, just information in your hands at the website, you can do that, uh, you can go to ibccares.org, the give tab's right there, and then you can just follow those instructions and scroll down, our app as well, uh, you can download the Share Faith app, and then search for Emmanuel Baptist Columbus, install it, and then just follow those instructions, so that's simple and easy to do. Uh, what I want to do is just uh, bring you up to speed where we're at. We're in the Gospel of John. And uh, as we look through the Gospel of John, really what we are doing is, is we're meeting God face to face uh, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. As we look at Christ, he is showing us who the Father is. As he lives among us those three years that he ministered here in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we are getting a glimpse of God in the flesh. And so uh, we have been in the Gospel of John, and just seeing Jesus Christ, he's, uh, he's so real, uh, what he has for our life. And so I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 13. We're going to be in John chapter 13 this morning. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of context as we move forward into, the, into where we're going to be this morning. The context of the passage is this, as we're moving forward, Jesus Christ is, is uh, this is the night before he's going to be crucified, and he's meeting with his disciples uh, it's the feast of the Passover. Jesus knows that his hour has come. This is the hour that he's going to give his life out of an unconditional, conditional, sacrificial love for us. And so having loved his own, it says, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And, and that's the theme I want to pick up this morning, uh, is, is the complete and perfect love of Jesus. You know, as we're just facing uncertain times, to go back to Christ and to look at him and to know that he loves us. In, in every circumstance, and he perfectly is able to be sufficient in our life because of that love. Uh, what we learn from Christ is easily transferable to our life. So just in summary, just to give you some pieces, as we were in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 11, we saw this, how, how the Lord loved in his own life. I mean, how he modeled that. Uh, he loved when it was the hardest. You know, verse 1 just reminded us as we looked at that. He's going to the cross. He's going to give his life. And yet, instead of just being consumed by that, he loved. Uh, he loved his enemy. There in verse 2, you have, you have uh, the devil and Judas. And you have Judas there being a part of the twelve and Jesus showing incredible love there. He loved in spite of his majesty or in, in light of his majesty. There in verse 3, uh, where he has all authority and he has come from the Father. He's going to go back to the Father. And, uh, you know, when he could have done so many other things and, and treated us in such a different manner, he chose to love us instead. We also see in verses 4 and 5 where he simply just took uh, the initiative. And you know this account so well, where he just washed the disciples' feet. That's what he did. And uh, he ministered to them. 
And we're going we're gonna to pick up from that today and just, and just uh, move forward from that example of the Lord. Uh, we saw in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, simply that, that uh, he modeled to us how to love difficult people. You know, here Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, you are never, you are never going to wash my feet. You know, and he loved the Lord, but he was, he was embarrassed. He was humbled. He thought that wasn't the place for the Lord. And he made it absolutely clear. You're never going to wash my feet. And then the Lord says, if, if you don't, you, you don't share in this relationship with me. And, uh, and, then, and then Peter responded and said, not just my feet, but my head and, and my feet. And, and um, he had a response there. Verses 10 and 11. Uh, he loved people where they were at. You know, these are all examples to us. He loved the disciples. Where were the disciples? Where were they in the heart? What was going on? Uh, he loved Judas in the midst of what he knew was about to take place. You see, the context here is this. In chapter 14, verse 27, we just see uh, the disciples themselves, uh, they are greatly troubled in their hearts. Uh, they're afraid. They're afraid for, for what's going to happen to Jesus. They are afraid for their own life. Um, they clearly feel fear the possibility of losing their life because of their association to Christ. And so, you know, they're facing fears in their culture, in their time, and in their life. We're facing the same fears in our culture. We don't know what's going to happen with what's going on with the, with the whole COVID element, the coronavirus element. We don't know what the next steps and the next weeks are going to bring. And yet the same reality is true. Jesus Christ is with us. He knows. He knows the fears that we face. He knows the uncertainties that we face. He knows all those things, just as he did as he ministered to the disciples here. He is perfectly able. And in the midst, in the midst of this great challenge, what he emphasized and taught us was the need to be to be loving. He says, I've given you an example that you should also do this, to love this way. And so this is what I want to focus on this morning. This is what I want to look at this morning. So we're in John. We're in chapter 13. I want to pick it up in verse 12. We're going to go through verses 30. And we are called here to love like Christ. Um, you know, now we're in our homes and we're kind of just with our families and maybe with a few friends from time to time. But we're in really small groups and uh, we feel almost like um, <laughs> claustrophobic, maybe, not able to get out and do the things that we normally have done. Uh, and so God speaks into our situation, into our circumstances, into our life. And he reminds us that even in these circumstances, he calls us uh, to exemplify and to model love to our families, to our brothers, our sisters, our mom and dad, to our children, to our grandparents, to our neighbors, uh, to be uh, believers who exemplify love. So how, how do we do that? That's the question that we face this morning. How in the world do we do that when circumstances just kind of turn our world upside down? Not only just the coronavirus, but it's affected you. Maybe you've lost your job because of that. Uh, uncertainties, maybe there's already simply simply uh, realities in your life. Now, this is just, this is just added on top of that. And uh, Jesus reminds us that he loves us perfectly in, in that. He's able to meet our need perfectly in that. And he reminds us that we're able to convey through our lives to others the same kind of love that cares for others like Jesus does for us. So how do we do this? Well, let's look at this. Verse 12 of chapter 13, we read these words. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you, the first thing that we do in, in loving like Christ is we just simply have to take time to understand him. He asks, he asks a normal question. The disciples don't know the answer. They don't understand what he's doing. It's going to take them time to, to assimilate and to understand what, what Jesus Christ has done when he stooped and he knelt before them, not to worship them, but to serve them, to wash their feet. He who is King of kings and Lord of lords, he stooped. And he washed their feet. It was beyond comprehension for them, for him to take this step. For us, to be able to love like Christ, we simply have to know him. We may not always know him and understand everything that he's doing in the moment. But when we come to his word and, and, and we immerse ourselves in his word and begin to read about who Christ truly is, how he loved us, and we see his heart, we see how he lived his life and how he served we see how he promised to enable us to do the same thing. Then we begin to understand what God has called us to and how he enables us to do what he's asked us to do. 
And so we begin to understand, God, what is your heart? Lord, what is your heart? Help me to know you. The way we're going to do that is to actually open his word. Every day, we have to take time and just get to know Jesus Christ. To get to know God. We have to be a regular learner of the word of God so we can understand Christ. If I don't, if I don't know him from this, I don't know how to live for him. And so we have to take the time to do that. The second thing that we have to do here is this. In verse 13, we read this. You, Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If we're going to love like Christ, then we have to recognize his authority for our life. Jesus Christ is, was to the disciples their master, their teacher, their Lord. They followed him in everything that he did. And yet they struggle as human beings. Jesus Christ is, is our Lord. He is our master. He is our authority. And because he is that, then he has the right to, to bring into our life um, the path that he has for us, uh, the calling that he has for us. And so when we recognize who Jesus Christ is, we recognize that what he's going to ask us to do is going to give us an opportunity to, to uh, impact other people, uh, to show grace and to show love, uh, to have a witness, to have a testimony, to experience simply just the satisfaction, the joy of walking with the Lord, the peace that that brings. When we recognize his authority in our life, then we, then we follow him in obedience and we, and we capture his heart and it becomes our heart. And our world changes in the midst of what's going on around us. My heart changes. And how I view my world, it changes because of who Christ is. He had an authority, his father, and he yielded and he followed. And we're going to see that. And so as we do that, we begin to learn the ability to do what he's asked us to do. Not only that, we come to verses 14 and 15. And Jesus says this. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And so we see here that to love others is, is to reflect the priorities that were important to Christ. That is to serve others. That is to serve others around us. Right now, who it is that God's called you and I to serve are the people that are closest to us. It's the ones that we're living with. We often think of the one another's, loving one another's. We're to love one another. We often think of that in, in the context of being at a church. But now that, that reality is, is, is to be carried out of home with, with my family and with my neighbors. And God wants me to, to capture the heart of how can I serve my family and how can I serve my sisters and my brothers? How can I serve the ones that are right here in my closest context? Um, just as Jesus Christ did. And so his priority was this. It was to serve. He had washed their feet. And he says, you know what? That's the example for us. The example isn't necessarily in the washing of the feet. The, the context here is not so much the ordinance of foot washing. It is the context of as Jesus is going to the cross, he is showing his disciples the priority of love. And the way he does that is, is to bow, is to stoop below them and to serve them even though even though they are struggling, even though they just prior to this had been arguing about who's the greatest, who's going to be the top man, who's going to get to the top of the ladder, uh, who's going to be number one. And he, and he takes that moment, and Judas is here, and Judas is going to rebel, and yet he takes that moment and he serves them. He even serves his enemy. Um, what grace. And he allows us to, to live and to do that as well. Then verse 16 and 17, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. We see in that text here that uh, we are to embrace humility. Um, we can't begin to even think about others in this context, in this way, unless we allow the humility of God to penetrate our heart. There's no way I'm going to serve my brother. 
or my sister or my mom or my dad or my neighbor unless first I understand what God has done for me, unless first I understand uh, how he loved me in spite of my flaws, my vulnerabilities, my weaknesses, my sins. When we see Jesus doing what he did, that's what he does for us today. He, he serves us with his life even today. When we don't deserve it, he has served us. He's asking all of us who are in Christ to take on this mind, the mind of Christ, and to serve others in the same way. Uh, he says here in, in verse 15, um, he, he mentions a servant and a messenger. Jesus Christ came to serve and he came to be an ambassador for his father. Remember, he's king of kings and lord of lords. He created the, the heavens and the earth, the universe and all that there is. He, he is the author of life. And yet he yielded himself willing to, willingly to his father. He came to serve with his own life, to give his own life. He came to be an ambassador all through the Gospel of John. He says, I've come to speak the words of my Father. He yielded everything that he did to his Father. And so he asks us to do the same thing. He is sending us to do the same thing. He says to us, we are to yield. We're to yield to him in humility. Because it's such a, it's such a privilege to have the opportunity to serve others, to show the love of Christ. That, the love of Christ is, is the very thing that breaks down uh, barriers and hearts and walls that stand between people. When we can love people when they don't deserve it, when we can love people unconditionally, we are being like Christ. We are being an ambassador into someone else's life. We are being a difference maker in someone else's life. We are working on this verse as a church, and so it's, it's, it's appropriate here. Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18, and it just reminds us, he, the call into all of our lives as the believers is, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Christ has called every believer to this. He's called every believer simply to be a difference maker for Christ, to give the gospel, uh, to love others who don't deserve it, to love others with truth, the truth of the gospel. To love others with expressions of humility. To wash their feet, as it were. To get down and dirty and to serve and to act uh, uh, for the good and for the benefit of those who maybe are even our enemy. Of those who don't deserve it. Uh, we're going to see more of that in just a second. Let's just be real about this. What are the, this is challenging. This is frankly impossible. I can't do this and, and neither can you. Uh, unless the Lord is, is doing something in my heart, unless the Spirit of God is at work, I can't do this. The challenges are too many. The challenges are too great. I simply can't do this. And maybe that's what you're thinking this morning as you're watching is, you know what, I, I, I can't do this. I can't love my, my brother or my sister or my mom or my dad or my family or my neighbor. I, I just can't. They're, they're, they're this and they're this and they've acted like this and they treat me like this. And you know what, we've all been there. And yet the Lord gives this call to every child of God that not only are we, are we uh, to love like this, but then he promises to enable us to be able to do this very thing. He promises to transform our hearts so that we can see others through the eyes of grace. But it is challenging. And so let's be real about that. And that's what I want to look at here. What are those challenges we face? Well, look at, uh, look at verse 18. And Jesus continues and he says this. I am not speaking uh, of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. And truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In verse 21, after saying these things, Jesus was he was troubled in his spirit, and he testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. You know, in this, in this text right here, there's two things happening, challenges. First, the positive side of the coin. In verse, 20, in verse 19, he says this to the disciples, to the 11 disciples specifically. He's saying this, I am telling you what's about to take place in the next moment to come. I'm telling you before it happens, so that when it does happen, that your faith in me is going to grow exponentially. It's going to transform your life. It's going to change you forever. That is exactly what, what takes place in the lives of these 11 men. 
They change. They are transformed because of the example of Christ here. They will never be the same. There is power that comes into, into the life through this. You know what? When we love people, we have the ability to impact them in ways we can't even comprehend. But the challenge is this. Not only is there a personal impact in someone's life, there is, there is genuine headache, heartache when we love others. Our hearts, our hearts can, be, can be taken to a, to a difficult place when we are trying to love as God would have us to love. You know, in verse 18, he says this, He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And in verse 21, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. He says, one of you is going to betray me. As he was loving the 11 disciples and loving the world and loving Judas here, he knew exactly what was about to take place. And he was committed to loving Judas. He was committed to loving the 11. And um, Judas had just had a meal with him. A meal is a place of, of fellowship. A meal is a place of friendship. It's the Passover meal. It is, is to kind of take a bond and, and, and community and unity together. And yet at this very table... Judas is going to betray him. And throughout this whole time, Satan is here. He is, he is impacting Judas. Judas is here. He has already made his decision to go. He has already sold Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And yet Jesus, and Jesus knows all this. Could, could you and I, could we, love, could we love someone that we knew was going to destroy our life? This is the challenge that we all face. Can we love someone in this situation? To love people brings, uh, at times, real heartache. It brings, um, there's a real risk to love others. Because there may be a pushback against our love. That's what takes place here. Another thing is this. In verse 22, we see the disciples, after he said this, they looked at one another. And they were uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. And so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. There's Peter again. Hey, hey, who is it? And so that disciple leaned back against Jesus. We know that to be John. And he said to him, probably, Lord, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And down in verse 28, now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. We're going to read that in just a second. The challenge, the challenge to, to loving people is this. It's, it's our inability to truly see the heart of people. Again, as, as we just consider the... The call to love is always a risk. We make ourselves vulnerable when we love like this. Because there's a real, there's a real chance that, that maybe a response towards that love is going to be pushback and is going to be a rejection, is going to be, is going to be a response that, that we don't appreciate, and a response, a response that we don't expect, and a response that even though we've prayed is maybe not where that, that heart is. And as we know each other in life and, and view each other, we don't know where everybody's heart is. <clears throat> we don't have that sense. The disciples here, they didn't know. They didn't have a sense. Other Gospels bring this, this nugget in. They were all sorrowful in their hearts because they thought, is it me? Is it I? Is it I? And they all were asking that question to themselves, is it I? They didn't know. They all thought and knew that they were capable of doing that. They were afraid. They were terrified that maybe it was them. None of them had a clue that it was Judas. They've been together now three years. And none of them suspected that it was Judas. They simply didn't know. And so what Judas is about to do, they're still not going to understand in the moment until down the road. It's, it's an it's a absolute shock to their system what Judas is about to do. And when we love people, sometimes we are... We are mortified and we are terrified and we are hurt and we are stretched and we see people make decisions and choices that go against the love of Christ. That's when it really gets hard, folks. And I know that and I understand that. And, and that's the challenge that we all face. The Bible just reminds us there are those we see here in Hebrews. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its ways and do not stay in its path. Job chapter 24. And uh, 
Judas ultimately is this. Jesus reminds us in Hebrews 4.13, no creature is hidden from his sight. All of us are naked and exposed to God. All of us must give an account to God. Jesus knew that right in that room. He knew that Judas was going to have to give an account. He knew that those 11 are going to have to give an account. Uh, And yet he loved them, folks. He loved them. He loved them. He loved them. Um, And so that's the challenge that we face. We come to... uh, Verse 22, we just saw that, didn't we? Verse 22, verse 27. And after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do it quickly. You know, another real challenge that we all face is this. As his church, as his people, as you and I are trying to love and love the way he would have us to love, this is the reality. Satan is always acting. He's always trying to undo every act of love, every act of grace. That's what he's trying to do in your heart and in mine. He's trying to unnerve us. He's trying to bring doubt into our life. He's trying to, he's trying to bring just uh, ammunition into our, into our brain and into our heart about the person that, that God is calling us to love. Well, that person did this, and that person's this way, and that person doesn't deserve to be loved and that person and we can just fill in the blank and we can look at others through that lens and you know what it's real easy not to love when we when we have that mindset what jesus does is he transforms our our heart he transforms how we view those difficult people he transforms how we see others and he gives us the ability to see them through the eyes of grace are you able to see the people even in your own family through grace and through love are you able to love them uh, even though it's not easy Here Satan is, Satan is active right here at the table where Jesus Christ is trying to minister and and to lead his his disciples. Satan is trying to undo everything that Jesus is doing. Satan does that in the church. There's only one Satan. He can only be at one place at one time, but he has an arsenal. He has a force. He has an army that works with him. He's trying to undo everything that happens in the church. Every time the church gathers, whether it's two or three or however big the amount is, whenever we are trying to do the will of God, Satan is trying to undo that, either in our own heart or in the circumstances around us or in the people around us. He's trying to simply undo that. That's what he's doing here. That's the challenge that we face. It is not easy, folks, and I know that. Uh, and, in the con- and in the context of this, not only that's true, but they are afraid for their own life. They are terrified, and so they're thinking about themselves, and then they're hearing Jesus say, I need to love like this. We're facing moments in our life that are, that are not abnormal in our nation. It's going to stretch us and challenge us, but it's going to open up opportunities for us to see the very power of God in our own personal life, our own personal walk with God. God's going to enable you and I to make a difference in our families and the people around us and in the connections that we have in our life and to, and to love like this. Satan is a deceiver. He's an angel of light. First, Second Corinthians eleven fourteen shows us, uh, you know, any input that comes into our life that is not consistent with the Word of God is a tool of Satan. Uh, whether it's media or online or people or peers or friends, any input that we get into our life that seeks to call us away from from this call of life to love others biblically, to be like Christ. To be uh, yielded to him is an input in my life that I don't need. It's an input in my life that I need to that I need to submit to the power of the word of God. And then we move on and we see this. Verse 30. As John wraps up this passage, he says these words. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Judas has received the bread. Jesus hasn't instituted the Lord's table yet. That's going to come right after Judas leaves. They've had this meal together. And Satan enters into him and Judas leaves. And it's telling what this verse says. He left immediately and it was night. It wasn't just night because it was dark outside. It was night because in the soul of Judas, there was darkness. In the soul of Judas... There was a disconnect between him and his Savior. In the soul of Judas, you have an unbeliever who is leaving a group of of believers, the other eleven, and he is stepping out to betray Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world, but as we see here, is not the Savior of Judas. Judas here 
makes a final decision. He rejects, he rejects Jesus Christ. There is a rejection in, in the heart of Judas that is final. Uh, grace really comes to an end here for Judas. That's what takes place. Judas makes a final decision. I'm not going to follow Christ. He, he looks at what Jesus Christ has just done. He has just observed Jesus love him personally to the very end of his rebellion. Jesus has given him every opportunity of grace. Jesus knew his heart, and instead of casting him out, Judas for three years was in this inner circle of the twelve. He ministered with the twelve. He saw the miracles of Christ. He, he experienced God at work. And yet in all this time, what didn't take place was the transformation of his own heart. He was on the outside looking in. He was participating, but he was not connected to Christ. He had no relationship to Christ. He had not yielded to Christ personally. He had done the things that Jesus had asked him to do. He had done it out of duty. He had done it out of excitement. It had been an experience for him. It had been, it had been a cause for him. It had been all these good things in his life. But at the end of the day, what he lacked, what he lacked the most was simply a personal faith in Jesus Christ. He didn't believe the agenda of Christ. He didn't believe the call of Christ. He didn't believe that Christ was who he said he was. And so he steps out and, he's, and he's, he tries to manipulate history and Christ on his own. And it winds up bringing the death of Christ. He steps away from grace. When we love people like this, we're going to... What makes it really challenging and really hard and really difficult is we, is we see people, even though grace and love are extended, we see them reject grace. We see them reject love. We see them reject us. You know, it's hard to love like this when we're personally rejected. Jesus was personally rejected here. Judas says, no, I don't want it. And he walks away. And not only does he say, I don't want this, he actively then betrays Jesus Christ and turns him over to the authorities and is the instrument through which Jesus Christ is executed and gives his life. Maybe you've been hurt like that. Maybe there are people in your life that have hurt you just like that. There are people in your life that you find it impossible to love because of whatever fill in the blank. And Jesus calls us to view them through this lens. He calls us to look at them as he looks at us, as he looked at the disciples. And he says, you know what? Because I have loved you, we're to walk in love in the same way. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 shows us we are to walk in love just as Christ loved us. He gave himself up for us. And when he did, it was, a, it was a fragrant offering. It was a sacrifice to God. And he calls us to do the same. We are, we are to be defined by the love of Christ. We're to love others by the power of Christ, the power of God. We're to love as he, right here in this passage, loved us in humility to get down and dirty, to be willing to be rejected, to be willing to love people that don't deserve it from our point of view, and to view everyone through the eyes of grace. Everyone needs the ministry of the love of God. Jude, if we look at anybody in our life and say, well, they don't deserve it, all we have to do is consider Jude is here. He didn't deserve it, and the Lord loved him. All we have to do is consider the 11. All we have to do is consider ourselves and just say this, I didn't deserve it. I was actively a rebel against God. I was in the same place. And Jesus, in his grace and his love, he reached into my life and he loved me. I'm asking you to, to embrace Christ and to look into your own heart and say, have you, have you received God's love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the first step. It's to receive that love. And then simply to embrace that and to say, Lord, because you loved me like that, that's going to be my greatest mission is to love others with my life, with your truth, with the word of God, in my life, through my life, and on my lips, in the testimony of my life, Lord, that's how I'm going to live. Next week we're going to pick it up and we're going to, we're going to develop even further what, what it means and what it looks like to love like this. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. This is the first time we've done this and uh, we'll make some improvements. Maybe there were some technical difficulties this morning. I don't know. I think it went okay, but uh, give us feedback. You can private message us on the church web, web page. 
Uh, we'll, be, we'll get back to you. If you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to do that. Join us next week. Uh, we'd love to have you with us. And we're going to keep walking through. Uh, I just teach the scripture. Let it speak to our heart. And that's what we've tried to do this morning. Let's just bow in prayer. And then we'll, then we'll go on our way and serve the Lord today. Lord, we thank you for this uh, challenge from your word. It's not the end of the story. There's more to tell. Uh, but Lord, you've called us to look into your eyes, to look into your life, and to understand that you have loved us with an unconditional, with a perfect, with a sacrificial love. Even, even today, you love us. We've not earned your grace even today. We've done things this week that they were not your heart, and yet you have loved us perfectly. And in that love, you enable us and you, you equip us to, to grow and to be like you. You help us to... Uh, uh, to show Jesus Christ with a greater clarity in our life. Help us to embrace that. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that just needs that love of Jesus Christ for the first time in salvation, by your spirit, would you just touch their heart? They can contact me. We, I'd be glad to talk with them. Lord, thank you for this week and the circumstances of our life and what we're facing. We don't know what's coming this week, but we can still serve you. We can still experience the grace and love of Christ and be instruments of your love. Help us to embrace that, to fulfill our call to that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Join with us again next week at 10 a.m.